Hello, my name is Dr. Alina K. Fong. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist at Cognitive FX, and it is my honor to talk to you today about uh, the cognitive and social effects of COVID-19 on caregivers and survivors. So directly or indirectly, COVID-19 infection can induce or worsen an acquired brain injury. So as we see here, SARS impacts neural function and supply of blood to oxygen and tissue. So what can we learn from other types of acquired brain injury and how do we utilize this knowledge to maximize potential recovery for these patients? For additional informa information or conversation about some of these indirect and uh, direct viral mechanisms of COVID and how it relates to brain injury, my colleague and I actually uh, wrote an article early this year. We encourage anyone interested to, to be able to read that. It was entitled Encephalitis and Cytokines, When Viruses Like COVID-19 Have Long-Term Effects on the Brain. Uh, we discuss how, how viral infections can affect the brain even when they're not capable of crossing the, the blood-brain barrier. Uh, we talk about how COVID-19 could cause long-lasting brain dysfunction and whether PCS patients or post-concussion symptom patients should be considered high risk. Now let's look at organ damage from COVID-19 infection. Uh, COVID has known effects on multiple organ systems, which is likely why it's the cause for its wide range of symptoms. Some symptoms affected include the brain. Even in young uh, patients, COVID-19 can cause strokes, seizures, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a condition that causes uh, temporary paralysis. And it's also linked to increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Many of you may be well acquainted with the acute symptom symptoms during infection, such as fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, headache, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. In fact, many of us probably have to fill out these questionnaires on a weekly basis at our places of employment. But how many of you are aware that some people may experience lingering issues weeks to months after they are declared even fully healthy? These chronic symptoms are still being monitored as we gather data on COVID survivors, but the question remains, why do certain individuals or long haulers, as they like to refer to themselves as, experience these chronic issues? And why does so much evidence point to the involvement of brain function? If we look to the right, we can see some of these chronic symptoms that these long haulers are experiencing, including COVID fog, very similar to this brain fog that a lot of our concussion patients report. There's, uh, of course, cough, the headache, the dizziness, but then there's also now mood disorders, muscle weakness and nerve damage, and joint pain. As many as one in three patients recovering from COVID-19 could experience neurological or psychological after effects of their infections. And when we consider the psychological, we must consider the impact of COVID-19 in our current medical field. There's less ability to see our doctor, and discuss general and mental health, and there's increased amounts of stress. As we will discuss later, this is a biopsychosocial issue and not just a biological one. Let's discuss a bit about the neurological effects of COVID. Multiple studies, from single case studies to larger nationwide research studies, have now shown that COVID has significant neurological implications. Some suggest uh, the current estimation of people infected with COVID who display symptoms is far too low. And those with even mild symptoms or even maybe asymptomatic may not avoid neurological complications in the future. In figure one on the right, uh, this is taken from Lal et al. 2020. This displays how the location may have different symptom manifestations. So for example, central nervous system is more correlated with headaches, dizziness, uh, cerebrovascular disease, epilepsy, encephalopathy, and, at and ataxia, whereas uh, the peripheral nervous system is more associated with the loss of taste, uh, hypogusia, the hyposmia, or loss of smell, and neuralgia. Additionally, some doctors have seen evidence of a sympathetic storm in some patients, which is a hyperreaction of the sympathetic nervous system that can cause these seizure-like symptoms and is most common after a TBI. Plant et al. in 2020 further investigated acute neurological and psychiatric complications of COVID-19. Altered mental status was uh, one of the most common presentations comprising encephalopathy, 
or encephalitis, and primary psychiatric diagnosis, often occurring in these younger patients. So what do we know? We know that COVID can affect the brain and it can cause symptoms that mimic brain injury. But what is the cause and how can we detect the cause in patients that show no structural brain or nervous system issues? Well, this is not a new problem. Uh, for those of us in the concussion world, mild TBI or concussions are injuries that are also considered invisible on CT and MRI. However, with advanced neuroimaging like diffusion tensor imaging, fMRI, uh, arterial spin labeling, SPECT, etc., we are able to detect dysfunction in spite of normal, quote unquote, normal structural brain imaging. Uh, my research is in fMRI, and uh, we and my colleagues here have published articles showing that neurovascular coupling dysfunction is involved in a number of cognitive and neurological disorders from neurovascular dementia, epilepsy, uh, migraine, uh, brain toxicity, etc. So briefly, neurovascular coupling is a process by which our vasculature provides accurate, precise, and plentiful blood flow to our neurons during activation. NVC, or neurovascular coupling, provides a rapid and sustained source of oxygen and other energy metabolites for our neurometabolic needs. Injury to neural tissues can decouple or uncouple this process, sometimes for months to years. When decoupled, the regional energy supply does not equal the energy demand. So this leads to neurometabolic imbalance and inability to provide substrates for healing, which can lead to chronic symptoms. At our clinic in Provo, Utah, we utilize task-based fMRI. We have adapted six different neuropsychological tests to the MRI machine, and each patient undergoes all six of these tests. Uh, we then analyze over 60 different regions of the brain and can provide sensitive and specific regional data, as well as an overall severity index score. But fMRI isn't just useful for detecting brain injury and functional changes in concussion, but also these other injuries like more severe and moderate traumatic brain injuries, stroke, tumors, um, hypoxia and uh, ischemia, infection, encephalitis, meningitis, and even chemical pharmacological issues. More importantly, from a clinical standpoint, it can be used for targeted multimodal treatment. So our results show that an fMRI-targeted treatment approach can drastically reduce chronic symptoms resulting from brain injury. So we had to ask the question, what would we see in a COVID patient on fMRI? I wanna discuss now our case study. We were lucky enough to meet, interview, scan, and treat the following patient. As background, prior to COVID, he was reportedly healthy, active, high-functioning. He, uh, I believe, was an actuary and only had one isolated incident in his teens that might have been a concussion, but with no reported lingering issues or symptoms. Based on his PCSS, or his post-concussion symptom scale at intake, despite no other diagnosis in COVID, he reported uh, the following symptoms, and you can read those uh, in the slide. Um, and for those of us in the business, we are, these are very commonly reported uh, symptoms for PCS and other types of brain injury. But, you know, of course, this wasn't your typical concussion. This wasn't a concussion or your typical brain injury. And so upon other questioning that looked at other symptoms, this is what he reported. Now, again, he contracted uh, COVID-19 in February and suffered in the acute phases of the disease from February to March. So we were very curious, what would his fMRI results reveal? Because he reported so many symptoms that were very similar to our TBI patients, but also many symptoms that were not associated with, uh, with typical TBIs, we were very curious as to what his fMRI would reveal. So here we show the patient's pre-treatment SIS score, as I spoke before. The patient's SIS score was 1.89. Just for some context, the mean severity score for the healthy population is zero. The mean severity score for a concussion patient is 2.0. So we can see that his fMRI showed significant dysregulation in subcortical, language, and attentional systems as far as the biomarkers were concerned. Based on these findings, we were able to craft an individualized treatment program for this patient. He participated in cyclical, sustained, and targeted therapies, including, but not limited to, neuroocupational therapy, 
sensory motor training, uh, neuromuscular therapy, physical therapy, neurocognitive therapy, mindfulness and psychotherapy, DynaVision, neurosensory integration, vision therapy, vestibular therapy, along with built-in relaxation and uh, destimulation. This is founded upon our theory of PAR, which we also published in 2018. PAR stands for Prepare, Activate, and Recover, where preparation includes cardiovascular expenditure, exertion, aerobic exercise. We then activate the brain with cognitive therapies, and we have to build in rests and destimulation. Uh, much of our theory on active therapy is built upon uh, the works of my colleagues John Letty and Barry Willer over in Buffalo, and we definitely subscribe to a very active route towards healing. Now, when comparing his pre and post fMRI, we did find that this multimodal therapy significantly improved his neurovascular coupling dynamics and some of his symptoms. He went from a 1.89 pretreatment to a 0.14. The patient was still reporting symptoms <clears throat> despite drastic improvements with neurovascular coupling, which led us to the question why? This was very concerning to our team because when compared to our typical concussion patient, a typical con concussion patient can see a 75% reduction in symptoms, uh, both subjectively and objectively with uh, fMRI imaging. And we know that neurovascular directed therapy works. We have seen benefits of targeted uh, autonomic nervous system therapy, vestibular, visual, and other therapies. So why was this patient different? Well, first of all, he wasn't a concussion patient, right? Even though he had many of the symptoms of concussion patients, he also had a number of symptoms that were outside of what we thought were similar to concussion patients. Even after treatment, he still met language and attentional biomarkers and demonstrated dysfunction in a number of memory systems. So many of our other concussion patients uh, overcome these within weeks. However, this person's breathing, vestibular, and overall physical indices were still alarming. We last checked in with this patient on September 15th, and he reported that uh, weight loss is still a huge concern. We have kept in regular contact with this patient, and we referred him to a pulmonologist, a gastroenterologist, <clears throat> an endocrinologist, and we continue to monitor and work with this patient with, of course, the goal of hopefully 100% symptom remediation. So the conclusion is neurovascular coupling is a key part of the puzzle but we are still missing some of these pieces. So in summary, COVID-19 can induce changes in brain function that can persist for months even after the virus is cleared. Uh, the cause of, of uh, COVID acquired brain injury is multifold, including hypoxic and inflammatory damage and dysregulated neurovascular coupling after COVID-19 can be treated, but other issues may hide improvement in neurovascular coupling. So what does this mean for TBI survivors and caregivers in terms of prevention and management. How do we treat COVID-induced ABI? We were able to publish an article in the United States Brain Injury Alliance Summer Newsletter about tips for the summer of COVID with a brain injury and beyond. In this article, we addressed some of the biggest issues COVID-19 and the quarantine may be causing TBI survivors and give you tips on how to manage these issues. They centered around mostly mental, physical, and lifestyle strategies. In the mental area, we espoused and encouraged meditation, mindfulness, even journaling with a gratitude journal. Physically, we uh, encouraged people to get outdoors more safely, of course, and socially distanced in a socially distanced way. Maintaining good exercise and regular exercise, yoga, stretching, things like taking a bath and maybe even trying PMR or progressive muscle relaxation. And in the lifestyle category, implementing proper sleep hygiene, educating yourself on what sleep hygiene is, uh, maintaining a healthy diet and nutrition, and very importantly, keeping up social connections, either with phone calls or video calls. But these are just some very practical ways that we need to engage in in order to stay healthy, mentally, physically, uh, and socially. As complicated as COVID is for clinicians, we put together sort of a master checklist for us uh, when treating these COVID patients and these long haulers. These are just some uh, areas that we did not want to miss uh, when we're doing a comprehensive evaluation for these patients. 
And interestingly, you know, issues with one system can absolutely cause issues with another, like for example, interactions between neurovascular coupling, visual, vestibular systems, uh, and also dizziness, vertigo, etc. In conclusion, where do we go from here? And what is the future of COVID-19 management for the brain injury community? Uh, in summary, we provided evidence that COVID-19 should be considered an acquired brain injury. We talked about advanced neuroimaging and aiding in diagnosis and treatment. And we talked about ways to combat these neurological, psychological, and social factors and issues associated with COVID-19. But the most important thing that I want to end with is hope. If you search the term COVID-19 on clinicaltrials.gov, there are now as of today, which is November 12th, 2020, over 3,800, almost 3,900 publications of clinical trials, which included studies ranging from evaluation of small molecule ph pharmacotherapies, mesenchymal stem cells, or T-cell-based therapies, convalescent plasma therapies, immunoglobulins to medical devices in the treatment of COVID-19. And that's an excerpt from um, Gupta et al. 2020. So much research is being done with so much more research to be done. I would like to thank you so much for your time and attention today, and I hope I have shed some light on this subject for all audiences I know, including uh, clinicians, researchers, survivors, and caregivers who are listening. I know that with the rapid rate of research surrounding COVID, this information may be outdated in a few months, and I look forward uh, to the opportunity to speak again on this subject. And thank you again uh, for your attention and have a great day.